All right. Just have to get my notes out here. Alright, so we've been covering the past several weeks the Lord's Prayer. We're nearing the end of it, but I really hope that we've been able to bring some life back into something that may have become repetitious. Maybe you have, maybe it's not even a part of your regular routine to pray through the Lord's Prayer, but I really hope that as we've been moving through it, you guys can see the beauty of these words and the impact of these different aspects of prayer. You know, the disciples at the time Jesus was praying and he comes out and they're just like, Jesus, you're always gone praying. We didn't even know how to pray. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because they had many, many different prayers, but obviously their prayers themselves had been repetitious and they had kind of lost impact to their prayers. They're like, Jesus, why don't you teach us how you pray? And so we, this prayer here taught them three different things. For one, it taught them how to address God in the first place. And so we know it's not about getting the name right. Instead, he says, our Father who is in heaven. We identify specifically who it is, but we also realize this personal connection we have with God. Thanks to Jesus. Something that he is in the process of setting up for them now, but isn't fully set up at this, at this point in Scripture. He hasn't yet died for their sins. And this prayer does somewhat reflect that, as we're going to see today. But then what he gives them, after he tells them how to address God, is he then tells them what things to pray for, what areas to pray for. And from that point, everything in this is actually a request. Hallowed be your name. What he's saying is, God, will you make your name to be hallowed? Will you make it holy? Will you make it something special for all the earth? It is actually a request there in the original language. Not just an acknowledgement, though it is important for us to acknowledge God's name is holy. But if you remember, we've lost the true pronunciation of God's true name. The name he gave himself to the Israelite people, the I Am. Some call it Jehovah, some call it Yahweh, but both just aren't it. We can't quite get it. But you know what? What I see from Scripture? It says God then chose another name to make himself known by, to make great. And the name was Jesus, or Yeshua, as the Hebrew would pronounce it. But I love that song, Jesus Messiah, because when we say Jesus Christ, we're recognizing that Christ is actually a title, not a last name, and it means Messiah. It means anointed one. What anointed one is a symbol of is kingship. Jesus, the king and savior of his people. Though... His people soon found out he wasn't just their savior, he was the world's savior. To all who would come in through him. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. He's the only way. He says, he is the one. And so all who would come to him, he said, can have a relationship with God, can call God their Father who is in heaven. And so he gives them these different requests. How would be your name? He says, your kingdom come. Because we realize there's wicked kingdoms on this earth. Wicked kings with, with different ideas. Now, we don't call them kings today, besides the Queen of England. But um, we have presidents, dictatorships, uh, different types of rulers. And most of them, if we're honest, do not honor God. And when they do, it really is a sense just to manipulate people. So we say, God, we need your kingdom to come. We need your will to be done because it's not being done. There's so much tragedy in this earth. There's people who do not honor you, who do not follow your will. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have to then point the finger at ourselves and say, hey, God, help me to do your will in my life because I'm broken. And then we got to give us this day our daily bread. And we talked about the impact of that, of relying on God for our day-by-day -day needs. Knowing that we have to then put that in God's hands. God, what you supply is, is apparently what I needed. You have your perfect will and you are a good father. So I trust you and I will walk where you lead. And use what you give me. And then we get today's verse. 
Verse 12, this is going to be the emphasis for today, and that is, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is one of those topics that's probably over-preached, but at the same time not preached enough because it's a hard truth to accept. But there's several terms here that I need to define because uh, I'm also going to tackle Jesus' commentary on this verse, verse 14 and 15, if you'd look at that. Let me read that for you. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, there's a different word, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you do not forgive others, then your heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. Right here, there should be a question on your mind. Because what you're going to notice is you need to pay attention to the time that these things should take place. It says you presently should forgive, and then God will forgive you. It says God's forgiveness comes at the cost of you forgiving others. Now that can be something that's hard to understand. We're like, wait a second, you mean if I don't forgive others, I don't have God's forgiveness of my sins, of my debts, of my transgressions? We're going we're gonna to get to that, but I wanted to stir that up with you and leave you with that question. Um, but you will notice that God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others are intertwined closely, and they are continued to intertwine closely throughout all of Scripture. Amen. But let's define some terms here, because our culture would say that forgive is forgetting. I need you to understand, uh, forgiving and amnesia are two different things. <laughs> totally different things. You can forgive somebody of something they've done for you, but you shouldn't be knocking yourself because you're like, oh man, but I still remember it. That's okay. You're not, that just means that you have a good memory. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> what forgiving really means in its true literal sense is to let go, to no longer hold on to something, no longer hold something above somebody and say, this is what you owe me. When are you paying it back? Which then leads us to our word debt. The word debt here is used specifically and with intent. The word debt means something owed. This isn't just when you, when you um, need to pay back money. This would also refer to like your employer or your boss. When you work for them, they then are indebted to you until they pay you the money that you have worked for. They then owe you that money. It also refers to those that you help out. When you help out somebody, even if you're not expecting them to pay you back, they will feel indebted to you. There's this sense that they feel like they, they owe you something. They have to pay you back. And you can say, you don't have to pay me back. Don't worry about it. It's free of charge, but it's not going to change the fact that they feel that debt towards you because you did something towards them. So part of forgiving other people's debts of letting go is giving them a chance to let go of that. I love it. There's this beautiful uh, story of this mom who was trying to help out her neighbor who was going through a rough patch. And she didn't want her to feel bad about coming to her for help. So she went to her neighbor and said, hey, I'm out of salt. Can I have some table salt? And her daughter oversaw this, and later her, her daughter asked her, she goes, Mom, we have plenty of salt. Why in the world did you ask her for table salt? And she said, because table salt is something inexpensive that I knew she'd have and wouldn't be hurt if she missed. But it gave her something that she could give to me so that she would feel free getting something back from me. Take that to mind when you help somebody. Go above and beyond when you help somebody to also relinquish them from the debt they then feel towards you. Be thinking about that when you help people. If you want to truly complete your helpful act towards them, be thinking about that. But then leads us to the bigger picture here. When we feel indebted to somebody because they do kind acts towards us. I love... One of my favorite teachings of Jesus, and, I, and I'm not just saying that for the sermon's sake, it's literally one of my favorite teachings from Jesus, and um, it's this part where people are arguing and debating over whether to pay taxes or not. And so they ask Jesus, and Jesus picks up a coin, looks at it, and says, isn't that Caesar's face on it? Why don't you give to Caesar's what is Caesar's? If it's got his face on it, then it belongs to him. It's his currency, it's his money. But then he flips the script and give God what is God's. What bears God's image? We do. And so we have a debt towards God. If you don't believe me, if you're like, what has God ever done for me? Well, oh boy, let me tell you. His mercies are new each and every day. 
If you're here this morning, already you can't deny the fact that God has blessed you immeasurably with the ability to walk, the ability to see and get yourself here. As we've seen, that is God's, ability, God's way to, he can take it away and he can give it. <laughs> Your ability to hear what I'm saying. And even when you don't have the ability to hear what I'm saying, the ability to read captions or other things. The ability to read lips, the mental capacity to reason in your mind. It's not something everybody has. And it's not something that we are entitled to. We are entitled to nothing. God owes us nothing, and yet he blesses us immeasurably each and every day. And just because he blessed somebody more than you in different areas of life does not mean that he has not blessed you. We have to get over that. We can't say, I'm not rich because my neighbor drives a Ferrari. <laughs> you, if you keep comparing yourself to those who have more than you or better than you, you'll never be satisfied. In fact, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to others in general. But you should acknowledge where all the good things come from. Because there's also the salary man, the man that's like, I earned everything for myself, I worked for it. And God's like, how'd you work for it? Oh, you used your brain? I gave you that. You used your legs? I gave you that too. Your hands? Those too. I could take them away, but I gave them. And he does that because he loves us. He gives us those things because he loves us. It says it's meant to lead us into worship of him. But there is this debt then that we cannot pay when we realize that we have so many things that he has done for us that we cannot possibly pay back because nothing we do can profit God. He has everything. There's nothing we can give him that would, that would make him, that, that would benefit him, really. Nothing that he couldn't do himself. So it's impossible to pay back God. So there is this debt we cannot pay on that end. But that's, a, that's, a kind, of a, that's kind of a good debt. But then we have the other kind of debt. The debt of when we don't do what we should. When God has the expectation that we acknowledge him as God and that, we, and that we honor him as God and we don't do it, that's sin. Sin means to miss the mark. Not living up to the expectations of the one we're indebted to. And so, James 4.17, it says, Therefore, to one who knows what the right thing to do and does not do it, to them it is sin. So now there's a debt of not paying what we owe. And so that's what debt is. It's not paying what you owe. And then there's trespass, transgression. This is on the opposite end. This is when it's not, it's not not doing something. It's when you do something you shouldn't do. So we have debt as the sin of omission, not doing what you're supposed to do. And then transgression, trespass, is doing what you're not supposed to do, the sin of commission. When you break God's law, when you use his name incorrectly, when you lie to others. And let me say something controversial here. <laughs> that wasn't the controversial thing. <laughs> no. But I want you guys to know that on one end, God knows just how messed up, sinless, I mean, sinful, and helpless we are. He knows that. But at the same time, God actually does believe in you. Amen. He believes that you can do better. He has expectations for you that he does expect you to meet. But he is also aware that you will never fully meet one single one of them. That's what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5. He goes, you may be able to keep the law, do not murder, but you can't keep it fully in truth. You want to keep the true heart of it? If you've ever been angry with a brother, that's the root of murder. He goes, what about with adultery? You ever looked at someone in the opposite sex and longed for them? And you have committed that in your heart. And so he goes through and he pretty much breaks down this facade and he says, you guys may be able to keep the law in some sense, but you can't even keep one single point of it fully. We all are trespassers. We all are transgressors of God's law. None of us live up to it. So we're helpless. We are in God's debt. And so that's why we have to pray, God, forgive us because I don't know a single way to pay back a single bit of it. Even my best acts of righteousness are but dirty rags to you. Which, if I were to explain what that truly means, it's incredibly vulgar. Mm -hmm. Giving God our used rags. But this is God's love. He says, 
I'll forgive you of your debts, but I need you to forgive others of theirs. And so we have to forgive our debtors, and this is where things can get tricky. First, let me answer my question from before. You'll notice here in verse 13, sorry, verse 12, it says, forgive us our debts, meaning presently forgive us our debts, as we also had forgiven our debtors. So we have God's forgiveness in the present, but we should have already forgiven our debtors. So God's forgiveness comes after our forgiveness. See verse 14. If you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. So again, our forgiveness comes before God's forgiveness. Verse 15, but if you do not forgive presently, then your Father will not, will not forgive. That's future. So again, our forgiveness comes before God's forgiveness. Now why does Jesus put it this way? Because he has not gone to the cross yet. When he's talking to the disciples here, he's saying, forgive your debtors because I promise it'll be worth it because you will be forgiven. He's talking about the cross. How do I know this? How do you know I'm not just making this up when the word says so clearly otherwise? Because after Jesus died on the cross, when his disciples reflect on this teaching, when they repeat it, they repeat it the opposite way. It's awesome, actually. Um, Colossians 3.13, it says, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. That's present, that's ongoing. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. So the Lord forgave you in the past, so you should forgive people in the present. It's, it's flipped now, thanks to the gospel. Ephesians 4.32, another time. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. That's presently ongoing, just as God and Christ has also forgiven you. Now, now it's flipped. What changed was Jesus went to the cross. What changed is even when we could not live up to the standard in which God had for us, even though we always miss the mark because we are sinners, and a sinner means someone who always misses the mark. We can't live up to God's standard. Jesus died for us. He said, I will pay for your debts. And when he pays for our debts, when we know the innumerable amount of things that we owe him, because of the goodness he's done to us and the immeasurable amount of things we owe him because of the things we haven't done for him and the immeasurable amount of things that we owe him because of all the times we broke his law and trespassed against him. Three different types of debt, three different accounts. We can't even pay one single bit back. And yet Jesus forgave it all. And you truly understand that. And you truly understand that you have been forgiven much. When you truly understand the weight of that, then you will know how to love much. A true account with Jesus in Luke chapter 7, verse 40. If you'd turn there with me, because this is powerful. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 40. A little background. Jesus is actually having a meal with a Pharisee. It's not a common sight. Normally Jesus sat not with the religious leaders, but with the broken, with the sinners. But he had something he wanted to teach this Pharisee here. And so he's sitting down with the Pharisee, and he's having a meal with him. And the Pharisee's feeling pretty good about himself. Reclining at the table with Jesus. This righteous man who has performed great acts. But that's when this woman comes in. Just, it doesn't say what kind of sin she had in her life, but it does say she's a sinful woman. I mean, everybody knows that she is pretty wicked and messed up. And she comes to Jesus. And she comes weeping at his feet. And he says she has this perfume in her hands. And she's pouring it out on his feet. And she's crying and weeping over it and washing his feet with this perfume. Because feet back then were even more stinky than feet today. And they're washing. And so she's washing his feet with her tears and this perfume. Even using her hair to dry it. That is the state that she's in. I don't know if you guys have ever been at that point where your, your mental facilities are just gone. You're just broken. Your emotions are so heavy on you and you are just weeping at the feet of God over your sin. And that's what she's doing. And then he is thinking to himself, actually, verse 39, 
Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him. She is a sinner. But here's what Jesus had to say to him. This teaching is so powerful. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. So, in case you guys are wondering, 500 is much more than 50. <laughs> Verse 42, then they were unable to repay. He graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I guess the one who forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But she who is forgiven little, loves little. That's the truth we have this morning to dwell on. Do you understand just the immeasurable debt that Christ paid off for you? Do you truly understand that weight? Take time to reflect on it. And know that God's forgiveness is glorious and wonderful. That's the cycle. I love this cycle here. God has forgiven us an innumerable debt. And then you think of whatever someone has done to you. They may have done a lot towards you. But there is still a limit to the amount of stuff they can do towards you to hurt you. And I, and I tell you, no matter how deep it is, it can't even compare with the forgiveness God offered you. All that forgiveness on all those fronts. But I don't want to make light of it. Let me explain what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not keeping yourself in a harmful situation. Sometimes forgiveness, just like with that person who feels indebted to you, and they're going to continue to feel indebted to you until you give them a way to pay it back. Sometimes it's setting up boundaries and saying, if you want if you want a healthy relationship with me, if you want to fix it, you've got to stop sinning. Even God set that boundary. When he forgave people of their sins, what did he say? Go and sin no more. Stop committing the offense. You can't get out of debt if you keep accruing debt. Even financial experts. Here's a, here's a little tip for you guys. If you're struggling with monetary debt, cut up your credit cards. <laughs> cut up the thing that keeps you accruing debt. But then let's transfer that now. If you're harming somebody, if you need forgiveness from somebody, and you're asking for forgiveness, you need to cut up the credit card first. You need to stop doing whatever it is that has put you in debt to that person. Or if it's because you haven't been doing something, you haven't been paying something, it's time to start paying up. It's time to start doing. It's time to start keeping your promises. Until then, when you ask for forgiveness, you're like, forgive me, but I'm going to keep hurting you? That doesn't make any sense. That's not, that's not asking for forgiveness. And sometimes for some person, it's saying, I'm not going to let you keep hurting me. I may absolve the debt. I may relinquish everything you've done in the past. I will no longer hold it over you, but I'm not going to put myself in a situation for you to keep hurting me. Right. That's healthy. That's good. And if they need a way to get back, think about that, pray about that, and lay it at God's feet. The important thing to note, and my closing point would be the cycle of receiving God's forgiveness and of forgiving. We saw before Christ, he was saying, forgive because you will be forgiven. But now he's saying, forgive because you have been forgiven, and the two are so closely related. So when you're praying the Lord's Prayer, when you're getting to this point where you're saying, God, forgive me my sins as I forgive others of theirs against me, that's when you need to remember the teaching of Jesus on anger. When you're going and you're offering your gift at the altar, which by the way, that sa sacrifice they were offering at the altar at that time, that was probably a sin sacrifice or a guilt sacrifice. What God is saying, God will not forgive you of your sins until you make right with your brother. That's what he was saying to them. And now the script may have changed, it may have flipped, but the importance is still there. If you're asking God for forgiveness, you better remember the debts other people owe you and reflect God's goodness. 
Do what you can to settle debts, to make things right. Be a reflection of Jesus and what he has done for you. You want to bear the name of Christ and live like him. And I know it's hard. It's a hard teaching. So in the words of Jesus, him who has ears, let him hear. Amen. Can you stomach it? If not, it's time to spend some time in prayer. It's time to meditate on the gospel. It's time to pour out your heart before God. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your forgiveness that I know I don't deserve. I'm a broken human being. But God, I also thank you so much that you haven't given up on me. You haven't given up on us. Even when we fail to forgive, you say, get up. Amen. Do better. I believe you can do better because I have died for you. I have given you my Holy Spirit. God, I can't just imagine how your great kindness for me that I do not deserve. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for his spelt blood. Thank you so much for this forgiveness that, that is more than I can possibly comprehend. I pray, God, that you would be with those hurting in this room right now, those who have a trouble forgiving somebody, letting go of past wrongs, letting go of future wrongs. God, would you give them the wisdom they need to properly settle accounts? And God, if, no one in this, if there's someone in this room that is not right with you, that has not fallen before your feet and asked for forgiveness, they haven't accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God, would you bring them to their knees? Would, they, would you show them your great love? And Lord, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys.